Hello, everyone. Um, wherever, from wherever you're tuning in, it's nice to have you here. My name is uh, Sandeep Giri. Uh, I'm part of the Google Cloud organization, wherein I build uh, infrastructure for Google's machine learning. Um, it is my privilege and honor to introduce Wade Davis to us today. Um, a little introduction. Wade Davis is an ethnographer, writer, photographer, and filmmaker whose work has taken him from the Amazon to Tibet, Africa to Australia, Polynesia to the Arctic. At National Geographic, he held the title Explorer in Residence from 2000 to 2013, probably the coolest job title I've ever heard. He's currently a professor of anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. Wade has published 295 scientific and popular articles author of more than 20 books, including One River, The Wayfinders, the one we'll talk about today, Into the Silence, and Magdalena. He holds degrees in anthropology and biology and has received his PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. Davis is an honorary member of the Explorers Cup, uh, honorary vice president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, a recipient of 12 honorary degrees, and a member of the honor uh, member of the Order of Canada, among other distinctions. He is named by the National Geographic Society as one of the explorers of the millennium. In 2018, he was made the honorary citizen of Colombia by the president of the country. Davis has been described as, quote, a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and a passionate defender of all of life's diversity. I have been a big fan of Wade's work, um, and it is really, again, an honor to have Wade Davis with us. Well, thanks very much, Sandeep. And I'll just bring up these images here. Um, uh, oops, we've somehow gotten back to, let me go back here for one second here. There we go, this will do it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a delight to be with all of you. You know, one of the um, great pleasures of travel, as I'm sure many of you have discovered, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel the past and the wind, uh, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember, remember the central revelation of cultural anthropology. And that, that is the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality. The consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder in the slopes of Shomalungma, an uh, eagle hunter in central Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman in Mongolia. All of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of thinking, other ways of being, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that, if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of peoples of the world make up a kind of a social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know so well as a biosphere. And in an early book, I coined the term ethnosphere to try to create an organizing principle for this web of, 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 of humanity. And I define the ethnosphere as the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, myths and memories, inspirations and intuitions brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and innovative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat and the loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would suggest that 50% of all forms of life are moribund, and yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, 
scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When all of us were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. Of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, fully half aren't being whispered into the ears of infants, which means that literally half of humanity's knowledge is at risk. Now, of course, there are many who say, well, wouldn't it be better if we all just spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? And my answer to that is always to say, what a great idea, but let's make that universal language in Niptetuk. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Quechua. And you begin to feel as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry, to anticipate the promise of your descendants. But that dreadful plight is the fate of somebody somewhere on earth roughly every fortnight, because on average, every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, the reason this is so particularly tragic and poignant is that it's happening in the very generation in which geneticists have come to the fore to prove the validity of the truth of the central idea of anthropology, this idea of cultural relativism. Within our generation, genetics has revealed the genetic endowment of humanity to be a continuum, race as an utter fiction, we're all cut from the same genetic cloth. Indeed, we're all children of Africa, including those of us who walked out of the ancient continent some 65,000 years ago. And then in this extraordinary hegira, this diaspora of 40,000 years in which the human spirit was carried to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important point. If you accept that truth that we're cut from the same genetic cloth, it means all people share the same genius, the same raw mental acuity, the same human intellectual potential. And critically, whether that genius is invested in technological wizardry, the great achievement of Western civilization, or by contrast, invested in the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea of the 19th century that we somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London, that European society sat at the apex of a pyramid that went down the slopes to the so-called primitives of the world has been absolutely discredited by modern science, shown to be an artifact of that distant century as irrelevant to our lives today as a notion that clergymen had at that time that the earth was but 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the interconnectedness of humanity, genetics has come to the fore to prove the truth of the intuitions of cultural anthropology. And what this fundamentally means is that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 voices of humanity. And those answers collectively become our kind of human repertoire for dealing with all of the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. But the question becomes, what do you do about it? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, you can seek to create a protected area, but you can't make a rainforest park the mind. You can't freeze people in time like some kind of zoological specimen. Change is the one constant in human um, affairs. And so when I was recruited to the National Geographic at the, uh, in, in 1999 as part of the conservation mission of the society, charged with the task of trying to change the way the world viewed and valued culture in a decade, 
we weren't quite certain what to do. Academics recommended conferences or databases, and my eyes just glazed because ultimately politicians follow, they rarely lead, polemics are never persuasive, but storytellers change the world. So we decided that the way to try to make a difference was to tell the stories of the ethnosphere, to embark on these journeys to points of wonder in human culture where the beliefs not simply appear to be a, exotic, but where the beliefs and practices and adaptations reveal something directly about the wonder of this common human genius, with the idea that if people in our vast audience might be exposed to this, they might one by one change their perspective. And so let me, in the time I have today with you, take you on a few of these journeys we went. And let's start with the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination, Polynesia, tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern seas. And we know that 10 centuries before the Christian era, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail and would settle the entire Pacific Ocean. And these are sailors who even today on the mothership, the Hokalea, the Polynesian Voyage and Society, the, the symbol of this incredible renaissance of, of Polynesian navigation and voyaging, these are sailors who can name 250 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls beyond the visible horizon by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel. These are sailors who in the darkness inside the hull can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the, the canoe, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a, ri a, a, a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to place a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. And if we move from the greatest ocean sphere into the greatest forest, we enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda in the Northwest Amazon of Colombia, people who cognitively do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. Or further south along the Andean Cordillera, the Warani, an extraordinary people, first contacted peacefully in 1958. Hunters who can smell animal urine at 40 paces in the forest and tell you what form of life left that behind, not because they're sauvage in a Rousseauian sense, but because they are true natural philosophers who have paid attention with all of the human genius we share to the forest homeland upon which their lives depend. And this perspicacity leading to these remarkable uh, folk preparations, Karari, the flying death, the arrow poisons that yielded detubo curare and the muscle relaxant that revolutionized modern medicine in the 1940s. And it brings us into the realm of the shaman, who is often neither priest nor physician, but rather more like a nuclear engineer who periodically goes to the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. Shamanic medicine being based on the idea that the disequilibrium caused by disease must be addressed such that the balance can be restored. And to do that, the shaman must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance, to get into those distant metaphysical realms where he or she can work deeds of mag magical, medical, and mystical rescue. And this accounts for one of the curious anomalies in botanical science of the 120 known but, uh, hallucinogenic plants, 90% are from the Americas, not because the forests of equatorial West Africa were depauperate, but people there had another avenue to the divine, spirit possession. The root of these sacred plants is firmly rooted in, in, in culture. And so Ebene, the semen of the sun, seen here used by the Yanomami in a photograph taken in 1954 by my professor, the legendary Amazonian explorer, Richard Evans Schultes. These powders are chock full of tryptamines, close to brain serotonin, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine. To have this powder blown up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. It creates not the distortion of reality, but the disillusion of reality. But the curious thing is the way the powder is administered. 
through the nose because tryptamines cannot be taken orally, which brings us, of course, to ayahuasca, the vision vine, the vine of the soul, which is not a plant, it is a preparation, a combination of plants. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family, leaves full of tryptamines, but again, with the woody bark of a liana, full of beta carbolines. And the reason tryptamines can't be taken orally is that they're denatured by an enzyme found naturally in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other compound that momentarily denatures the MAO in the human gut. And it turns out that the beta carbolines, harmine and harmaline in the woody liana are precisely such MAO inhibitors. But here's the interesting question. <laughs> how in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants did the indigenous shaman learn to combine these morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create this biochemical version of the whole being some of the, uh, greater than the sum of the parts? The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is quickly exposed as a meaningless euphemism. You speak to the shaman and they say the plants teach us. It's not quite clear what that means, but it speaks to another way of knowing. And as we begin to unpeel the wonder of the belief systems themselves, we can suddenly see that within the society, the mythology, the cosmology, when you really understand it, it amounts to no, essentially a land management plan dictating precisely how people in great numbers could have lived in the upland forests of the Amazon. For these societies, people are not the problem, they're the solution. The most profound cultural insight of the Barasana, for example, is that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. And so when they go into the great ceremonies that can last for days, ingesting yahe or ayahuasca for 72 hours in a row, they become not symbols of the ancestors, they literally become the ancestors. They go off on a collective journey to points of origin, reaffirming the sense of obligation that human beings have to be stewards of the earth, to maintain the harmonic balances of the natural world. Again, this extraordinary sense of the relationship between people and the natural world based not on a precedent of extraction, but on some iteration of reciprocity, some variant of the basic idea that human, that the earth owes bounty, its bounty to humans, but humans in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And this becomes expressed in the Andean cultures in notions of sacred geography. You and I were raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined. That makes us very different than my godchildren in the mountains of the Andes raised to believe that a mountain was an Apu deity that will direct their destiny. The in interesting thing isn't who's right and who's wrong. Is a mountain a pile of rock? Is it a sacred being? It's how the belief system mediates a relationship between the culture and the natural world with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint of the particular society. Coca is to cocaine what potatoes are to vodka. And yet the traditional fields have been under assault for generations now, even though the plant is highly nutritious. Um, it is full of calcium for a diet that lacks a dairy product. It has enzymes that enhance the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation. We are in the midst of a, a massive effort to decouple coca from cocaine and create a nutraceutical market for a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity for 5,000 years by all the pre-Columbian civilizations of South America, a plant known to the Inca as the divine leaf of immortality. And so this relationship to landscape is played out in ritual. Once each year, for example, in the community of Chinchero, the fastest young boy is given the gift of becoming a woman. Wearing the clothing of his mother, he leads all able-bodied men on a run. But it's not your ordinary run. You begin at 11,000 feet, run down 2,000 feet, and then run to 16,000 feet, 
only to fall away into the sacred valley and cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a ritual day. And again, the idea is you go into the run as an individual, but through exhaustion and sacrifice, sacrifice in Latin meaning to make sacred, you emerge as a community that has reaffirmed your sense of belonging on the earth. These localized rituals become Pan-Andean. In the case of the Koyariti, tens of thousands of indigenous people converging on a sacred valley in pilgrimage, carrying the crosses in the shadow of the most important mountain of the Inca, Ausangati, planting the crosses in the ice, absorbing the power of Pachamama, and then returning the crosses to the community for the coming year. In the mountains of the Elder Brothers, the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, this highest coastal mountain range on earth, two hours from Miami Beach by air, a civilization still ruled in a bloodstained continent by sun priests, descendants of the Tarona, who literally believe that their prayers maintain the cosmic balance of the world. They call themselves the Elder Brothers and they dismiss the rest of us who have ruined the world as the younger brothers and they beseech us to change our ways and the training for the priesthood actually involves uh, uh, 18 years two nine-year periods in isolation during which time the world is only an abstraction as they are taught the values of their society and then after this extraordinary initiation the acolyte is taken out for the first time on a journey to the heart of the world, from the, the sacred temple to the ice, from the ice back to the sea. And all the time he sees for the first time in his life, the beauty of the world and the priest who has trained them says, you see, it's as I've told you, it's that stunning, it's that important, it's yours to protect. Ritual payments made at the sea, at the height of the mountains themselves. This is a good friend of mine, Mamo Camilo, who shared with me recently a message which I was happy to pass on to the Nobel laureate, the ex-president Juan Manuel Santos. Uh, thinking of the peace process in Colombia, in Colombia, Mamo Camilo said to me in Spanish, peace won't matter if it's only an excuse for the three sides to come together to maintain a war against nature. It's time to make peace with the entire natural world. Well, the lens of anthropology is often most usefully brought into focus when we shine it upon cultural practices of which we know nothing but about which we cast um, judgments. And no cultural practice could be a better example of that than the way we've come to think of voodoo, as if it was a black magic cult. You know, it's interesting, were I to ask you to the name the great religions of the world, what continents left out? Sub-Saharan Africa, as if the people south of the Islamic zone of the Sahara had no religious beliefs. Well, of course they did. And voodoo is not a black magic cult. It, it's, it's simply a, a fond word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. In many ways, it's a quintessentially democratic faith because the believer has direct access to the divine. The African people say, you white people go in church and speak about God. We dance in the temple and become God. And because you are taken by the spirit, you are all powerful. So how can a guard God be harmed. And you see these theatrical gestures here in Haiti, vo voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity, astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. We think of voodoo as dark black magic simply because the Marine Corps occupied Haiti in the 1920s, stayed for 20 years. Every soldier for the most part came from the american south during jim crow everybody above the rank of sergeant got a book contract the books had names like cannibal cousins black baghdad voodoo fire in haiti a puritan in voodoo land the white king of Lagunav, full of children bred for the cauldron pins and needles and voodoo dolls that don't exist zombies crawling out of the grave to attack people they gave rise to the rko movies night of the living dead and they essentially said to the american public that any place where such abominations occurred could only find its redemption through military occupation. Voodoo is simply one of the great divine expressions of the human heart. It's a religion, and like all religions, it's simply an attempt of human beings to deal with the mystery of death and, in some sense, to wrestle with eternity and to try to come out on top. 
So, you know, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful as they are, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural laws, if, you know, their failed attempts at being modern, nothing could be further from the truth. Technology, technology is no threat to culture. Change is no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. In every instance, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cult cultural survival. I spent a long time in Borneo with the last of the nomadic peoples of the Southeast Asian rainforest, the Penan. And living amongst nomads is an extraordinary experience. Think about it. They're so different. How, for example, do you define wealth in a society where there's a disincentive to acquire anything? Well, wealth is defined as a strength of social relations between people, because if they fray, everybody becomes impoverished. Sharing is an involuntary reflex. There is no word for thank you in the Penan language. Everything is automatically shared. I once gave a cigarette to a woman in an encampment and watched as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to the huts of the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And in these oral traditions that lack the written word, the entire knowledge of the community is encoded in the vocabulary of the best of the storytellers. And in these societies, there's a kind of a, a conversation that goes on with the natural world, such that the flight of a, of a hornbill becomes a kind of cursive script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But now the sounds of the force are those of machinery. And within a single generation, the clear streams of Sarawak became so laden with silt that it seems as if all of Borneo was slipping to the South China Seas. Women forced into prostitution, children suffering ailments never before known by the people, men humiliated, rising up, blowpipes against bulldozers, no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And so in a single generation, a way of life morally inspired has been crushed along with the people and the forest um, that gave it birth. Now, this influence of industrial ideology, if you will, and practice is quite in opposition to a society that we've known to be one of the oldest in the world, the civilization of Australia. Now, when the British first arrived in Australia, they saw a people that looked strange, had a simple material technology, but what really offended the British is that the Aboriginal people had no interest in improving on their material lot. And since optimism progressed through time was the ethos of European society, the British, in their inimitable way, concluded that the Aboriginal people weren't human. As recently as 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers had quotas as to how many abos could be shot with impunity who trespassed upon their land. What was in fact going on was a devotional philosophy far too subtle for the British to appreciate. That was the dreaming. The entire purpose in life in, in Australia was not to do anything to change the world. It wasn't progress and change that was idealized. It was stasis constancy. The entire purpose of life was to simply do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the point of its creation. It's like it, as if all of the Western intellectual thought had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it as it was when Adam and Eve had their conversation. Now, I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong. Had we followed this devotional philosophy. Yes, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. We also wouldn't be talking about climate change and our capacity to transform the biological and physical life support systems of the planet. Very often, the threat to culture is ideological. A nun at Angkor Wat, whose feet and hands have been severed from her body for the crime of pursuing her religious faith. In the mountains of Tibet, when the Dalai Lama, as a young man, 
met Mao Zedong, the man responsible for the death of more of his own people than Hitler and Stalin put together. And when Mao Zedong, this Marxist materialist of Beijing, said to the 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, the Tibetans knew what was coming. When the jackboot of the Red Guard marched into Lhasa, taking over finally in 1959, 1.2 million Tibetans were killed for their faith. 6,000 temples reduced to riprap and dust. And what was it about the Dharma that so threatened um, the Marxist materialists, this Western ideology adopted so foolishly by so many people in so many places in the world to their detriment? The Dharma is distilled in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean all life was negation. He meant that shit happens. The cause of suffering was ignorance. That wasn't stupidity. It was a tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the revelations was that ignorance could be overcome. And of course, the fourth was the delineation of a contemplative practice that, if followed, had 2,500 years of empirical observation that a transformation of the human heart could occur. So we made a film with Mathieu Ricard called The Science of the Mind of Buddhism, because what is science but the pursuit of truth? And that indeed is what the mission of Buddhism is. And with Shara Barma, a traditional Amshi doctor, I embarked on a kind of pilgrimage of the heart in pursuit not of a Western hero, those who climb the mountains of the Himalaya into a zone of oxygen deprivation so severe that it threatens life itself, which from the Buddhist perspective is about the stupidest thing you can do with a precious incarnation. We went in pursuit of a true Eastern hero, a bodhisattva, a woman who had gone into lifelong retreat as a young girl and for 45 years had lived in a single cell, dedicating her entire existence to the recitation of a single mantra. We began at Shiwang Monastery um, during the Mani Rundu ceremony that commemorates the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet by Guru Rinpoche in the 6th century and going higher, higher into the mountains, past the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, spent one full year in solitary retreat. And with Mathieu chanting the sutras, we came closer and closer until I took this photograph as a light shone on the face of a woman who had not seen the sun in 45 years. And the woman who greeted us was not a mad woman. She radiated loving compassion and serenity. And as Matthew said, this is the proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And later that night at a monastery, a Lama said to me something wonderful. He said, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so the Tibetans leave it to us why we tolerate the wrath of China uh, that is sweeping over a civilization that has truly given so much to the world. And so the question becomes, what kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony or celebrate a polychromatic world of diversity? Margaret Mead, before she died, said her greatest worry was that as we drifted toward this blandly amorphous generic world, not only would the entire range of the human imagination be reduced to a more singular modality of thought, but that we'd wake one day as if from a dream, forgetting that there are other possibilities for life. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern. It's not about freezing people in time. It's about finding ways that all peoples in every place can benefit from the best of modernity, if you will, but critically without that engagement, demanding the death of who they, of who they are as a people. And the reason for that is very simple. Culture is not trivial. It's not decorative. It's not the songs we sing. It's not the clothing we wear. It's a body of ethical and moral values that every society places around each human individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that lies right beneath all of us, as history shows. It is culture that allows us to make sense of sensation, to find order and meaning in the universe, to seek, as Lincoln said, the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost and individuals through coercion or volition seek to climb a ladder to affluence where the top is never reached and only the feet land on the bo bottom rung of a ladder that indeed goes nowhere in a sea of disaffection and alienation that results in the points of chaos around the world. The faces of these women dead in the 
genocide in Rwanda. Nation states are beginning to understand that diversity does not threaten the state, it enriches it if the state's prepared to accept the wonder of different visions of life itself. When the British reached the Arctic, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. The British didn't understand that there was no better measure of genius and the ability to survive in the harsh winter in which everything had to be forged from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were made of fish. The sleds themselves were made of frozen meat. Everything was based on an understanding of the cold. This photograph I took when I was polar bear hunting 250 miles out on the ice with men from Iglulik. That night our skidoo broke down, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius before the wind came up. And had I been alone, of course, I would have been dead. But because I was in the embrace of the genius of the Inuit, people. Of course, I survived as they always do, but now they are threatened by something beyond their capacity to adapt to the melting ice. This is a photograph taken in the northernmost community in the world in Kanak in northwest Greenland, where the ice used to come in in September and stay until July. Now it comes in in November and is gone by March. The world of the Inuit is melting from beneath them. So just to close this morning, with a more optimistic story. In the wake of 9-11, I wanted to tell a tale of Islam. So I traveled to Mali, to the great northern bend of the Niger River in the ancient port on the Sea of Sand of the Western Sahara, Timbuktu. Timbuktu, a town that at one point had 25,000 university students when Paris and London were mud hovels. And in Timbuktu to this day, which rivaled Damascus and Cairo and Baghdad as great centers of Islamic knowledge. And remember always that the knowledge of the ancient Greeks only survived to inform the Renaissance because it was carried in the repertoire of the great Islamic scholars. And today in Timbuktu, you can hold documents printed in the ten, hand, handcrafted in the, in, the, in the 10th century embossed in gold of astronomy, cosmology, botany, chemistry, uh, philosophy, and religion. And from Timbuktu, we traveled north to an ancient salt mine where the salt once traded ounce for ounce with the gold from the desert because until the discovery of the new world, two thirds of Europe's gold came overland from West Africa, 52 days from Timbuktu to Marrakesh. And so we traveled along this ancient trade route, a trade route where a young man must travel because before he can marry, because the desert is said to hone his spiritual devotion. And following these ancient caravans uh, with this extraordinary entourage, we found ourselves in this biblical site. My friend Isa Muhammad at Torg said he would not bring my wife, his wife there. I asked the truck drivers where they came from, and they said there are no nations here. We met a man in the mine who chronologically was younger than me, but his body was broken in servitude. He was caught in a system of debt peonage, having bought uh, his the safety, he, having, having taken a loan from a merchant to save the life of his child. Now he could never escape that debt, and the debt would condemn him to live in the pits of this mine for the rest of his life, but his total debt was less than the cost of a dinner for two in San Francisco. And so I gave him the money, and, and, and he blessed Allah for the receipt of it. And then in an instant, a sandstorm came through the desert, enveloped him in a haze of yellow uh, smoke. And I never found out whether he survived, whether he bought himself to freedom, was he killed for that money, was he even telling me the truth. But then as we went south, we came upon a caravan we had met going north. Rain had fallen, moistening the salt, which ruins its value if it cracks. So these young men, eight of them, stuck in the desert, 250 miles from a well, uh, with all the wealth of their family. And when we came upon them, they were down to their last liter of water. And it's suddenly desert that one can live two weeks without food, but death from dehydration comes overnight. The truck smugglers say that the great thing about brake fluid is it keeps you off the battery acid. And so what did they do with their last liter of water? They kindled a twig fire and brewed us tea, honoring the adage that you must kill the last goat that keeps your children alive with its milk to feed a wandering stranger who comes to you out of the night 
because at the end of the day, you will never know whether you'll be that stranger, cold, hungry, in need of rescue. And as I watched young Muhammad pour me a cup of tea with his precious reserves of water, I thought to myself, these are the moments that allow us all to hope. Thanks very much. Wow, Wade, fascinating. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your documentation of these amazing cultures of the world. And I think your message is quite important around protecting um, what you call humanity's greatest legacy of these languages and cultures. Um, I should mention that um, um, you know, of all the cultures you spoke about, and I know we are here to focus on the wayfinders as well, here's the book. Um, the chapter on Polynesia really captivated me. Um, and uh, I, I have to tell you, I've spent many nights um, uh, sleeping here in the mountains of California. And when I look up to the night sky, I cannot help but imagine those voyagers several centuries ago using the stars to navigate from Hawaii to New Zealand to Easter Island, which is only 20 kilometers wide, and hitting it with amazing accuracy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the really interesting thing, uh, Sandeep, about the Polynesian voyaging um, tradition um, is that it was all based on dead reckoning. Um, and it was the impossibility of using that methodology that kept most European transports hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of cr the chronometer. Because with dead reckoning, you're not setting a course and, and heading in in the direction of your compass bearing, you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. And so when you realize that the wayfinder sitting monk-like on the uh, stern of the vessel, in incidentally a civilization that lacked the written word, he or she had to remember every shift of the wind, every sign of the stars, the moon, the sun, um, symbols of the sea, uh, indications of speed, um, direction, all of this had to be remembered and not only as data, but also the order of its acquisition. And if that stream of recollection somehow broke, if the wayfinder fell asleep, um, the, the voyage could end in disaster. And so you, you have this extraordinary uh, and it's not, you know, it, the other thing about it is it, it's easy for us to say, okay, they here's how they use the stars. Here's how they use the sun. The stern of the vessel is a perpendicular so they can align to east and west with the breaking sun. You know, there's so many colors for this. You, we, we, can, we can individually delineate all the points of, of, of uh, observation. And in many ways, they are just like scientists. They're using the tools of uh, meteorology and oceanography and, and, uh, and climate. But what's really incredible is that the wayfinder has to be constantly processing all of that inflow of data all the time. Um, even while you're on this great vessel with, with a displacement of 24 a thousand pounds that is literally lumbering through the sea into the darkness. And I remember when I sailed with Hokalea, that's what really struck me. It was when we turned north from Molokai, heading into the, uh, the Pacific in the darkness with storms on the horizon, uh, realizing that the challenge of the wayfinder is, is not simply knowing how to use these particular observational skills, but how to synthesize it in this kind of holistic way to keep on top of the entire database. It's, it's an extraordinary e example of, of human genius. Yes, definitely. Um, I, by the way, I met Nainoa Thompson, who runs the Polynesian Voyaging Society. He came here at Google. And uh, for those interested, they not only is Hokalea navigating the Pacific with no instrument, it's navigating all the other oceans of the world and they have a website and social media presence on it as well. Um, so wait, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the environment. Um, once in an interview, you were asked why ancient wisdom matters in the modern world, and you responded two words, climate change. Um, now, it's quite evident that climate change will leave no culture of the world, of the world unimpacted. Uh, you also mentioned on CBC radio uh, a year ago that quote, saving the planet means listening to indigenous peoples. We in the West, with our way of thinking of the natural world, 
We are not the norm. In fact, we are the anomaly. Could you please help elaborate on that? Well, I, you know, I, I referenced that a little bit, uh, Sandeep, in my talk. Is that you know, you know, you, you know, all cultures are myopic, faithful to their own interpretation of reality. You know, most native tribal names mean the people. The, in, the idea being that the blokes over the hill are savages, right? And we too are culturally myopic, and we and we forget that we're a product of our history. And in in the Western tradition, to its credit as it tried to liberate itself from the tyranny of absolute faith, um, which was what the Enlightenment was all about, we kind of threw out all notions of myth and mysticism and metaphor, and Descartes said that all existed was mind and matter, and, and as Saul Bellow said, science made a house cleaning of belief, and in a sense, we deanimated the world, and, and the world became kind of a stage set upon which the human drama unfolded, and a mountain was a pile of rock, a forest was uh, cellulose and board feet, and I think that set in motion this kind of uh, extractive model by which we've interacted um, for at least three centuries, three centuries in which we've been consuming the ancient sunlight of the world. As I mentioned, most societies around the world um, have a very different kind of fundamental um, relationship to the natural world. It, does, it doesn't mean that, you know, the myth of the ecological native, it doesn't mean that they didn't cut down trees or exploit game or whatever, but the fundamental idea was based on reciprocity. And the Andes are a perfect example for that. You know, you can literally, in the Andes, the earth does feel alive because of such a dynamic mountain range and the earthquakes and landslides and, and, and so on, you know. And, and, and people see, you know, clouds condensing into rain, bringing water and fertility to the fields, a sort of cycle of life. It's almost before your eyes. Um, but that's kind of the norm. And that's certainly a healthier attitude for any human society to have to it. The other thing about climate change, I think it's important to remember, is that climate change has become humanity's problem. It wasn't caused by humanity. It was caused by this narrow subset of humanity that, that mastered this industrial production. And again, for us, from our worldview, um, climate change may be a political debate still in some quarters, uh, Lord knows why. Uh, it can be a technical challenge, it can be an economic opportunity, but for these societies, many of which are feeling the direct and immediate impacts of climate change, be it the, the melting of the ice on the Sierra Nevada or the rising seas in, in Polynesia, for societies that believe that they're responsible for the well-being of the earth, um, climate change has become a profound psychological, spiritual, and existential crisis. For example, that ritual I mentioned, the Koyariki, where the crosses are placed in the ice, the penultimate stage of that tradition, going back thousands of years, was to chip small blocks of ice from the glaciers to literally bring the mountain back to the community so that elders could themselves participate in the kind of the sacred cycle of the divine who physically weren't able to make the pilgrimage. But watching the recession of the glaciers, which they have no responsibility for, but they think it's their fault, they have kind of, in a very poignant way, unilaterally ceased to chip blocks of ice from the glacier, which is kind of moving if you think about it. And the other point, when you say, you know, I answered, you know, why are these societies important? They're important, when I say they're important because of climate change, what I mean by that is that the very existence of dramatically different ways of thinking about our relationship to the natural world, you know, uh, differences that allow us to put our own way of thinking in clear profile and perspective, um, these, the very existence of multiple ways of thinking, if you will, puts the lie, it suggests, it suggests their options, and it puts the lie to those of us in our own culture who say that we cannot change, when I think we all know we must change the fundamental way in which we inhabit this planet. Thank you very much, Wade. Um, fast forward to 2020, um, I, I do want to mention you authored a very widely popular article on Rolling Stones titled, The Unraveling of America. Uh, I, I highly recommend our listeners to read it. Um, so when COVID landed on the shores of the various nations of the world last year, um, it was a, uh, a response of public health. It was a response of political policy and economic response. However, you argue that it was something even more foundational. It was a cultural response. Um, and specifically, you deep dive into American culture uh, over the past decades, and you explain that it's the culture and its evolution that explains how it dealt with COVID. 
So if you can summarize the article for us and also share what has been the response to it thus far. Well, you know, that that, that was a kind of a funny story, Sandeep. I, you know, everybody had asked me to write about COVID and I didn't think I had anything new to say. And then I was paddling my kayak around our little island here in British Columbia and I suddenly had this flash, COVID's not a story of public health, it's a story of culture. And I wrote up an essay um, on spec and sent it to my old friend, Jan Wenner, who created Rolling Stone. Jan sent it to Gus, his son, who runs the company now. And they, after some clever editing, it ran. And against all expectations, it hit a nerve. And it ended up having 362 million social media impressions. Uh, Five million people read it on the Rolling Stone site. Visitations to my Wikipedia site momentarily soared from 150 a day to 4,000. It just hit this nerve. Because I think Americans were asking the obvious, you know, what what the hell's happening here? We seem to be ruled by a dysfunctional government at the head of which is a buffoon. And I tried to sort of um, I- explain the failure of America to deal with COVID. At that point in time, August of nineteen of twenty twenty, the United States was singularly behind the other countries of the G8 and certainly of Canada in the way it had responded. And I tried to explain what was going on through the lens of um, other trends in American um, social history, particularly post-World War II. Um, But, you know, um, some of what I said was, I think, really um, accurate. Uh, Some of it was was probably responding to the, the heated moment. Um, you know, one of the things we have to remember, China gave us COVID, America gave us vaccines. And so there's something still left in the in the quiver of American entrepreneurial spirit and capacity that we should always be grateful for. And in that article, incidentally, I was in no way gleefully anticipating the demise of America. Um, I, in fact, said that if and when China was ascendant, we'd all be nostalgic for, for the American century. But I was trying to just ask what this chaos in America was saying about where America is is today. Um, uh, the, the really interesting thing that actually got cut out of that article that I led the article with was a kind of more optimistic thing, I mean, which we've sort of forgotten. But the extraordinary thing about COVID is that, you know, for the first time in human history, we all share the same threat. Um, you know, this, 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 microorganism, this bit of virus 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt, which had not only commandeered our biology, it had also directly challenged the bonds of connectivity and community that for a social species um, represent what claws and teeth represent to the tiger, you know, and, 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 and I, I thought that it would be a very kind of, um, powerful message to remind us all that we, and it still is a message we should pay attention to, that we really are also biological beings living on a, on a living planet. Uh, we're not apart from nature. And there was also a more optimistic thing that came out, uh, Sandeep, in those early days. We suddenly saw the incredible resilience of nature. We suddenly saw you know, um, uh, um, wild boar re-inhabiting Barcelona, rivers in Medellin running clear, the skies over Delhi and Karachi clearing to reveal the white um, um, peaks of the Himalaya scoring the horizon. We saw the canals of Venice clear. We suddenly saw both how incredibly resilient the earth is, but also inversely, we saw the incredible impact that we have been having on on the, the the planet and i sometimes worry now that those profound lessons which i hope would really powerfully resonate um have been sort of buried in the tragedy of all the mortality and morbidity that so unexpectedly came to us uh, from from this um, this pathogen, I mean, you know, when I wrote that article, um, things did not look good. Um, the fastest development of any vaccine in history up until that time was for months, and that had taken four years. Well, imagine if the genius of science hadn't given us this not just one but a plethora of effective and safe vaccines, which we've all um, had access to. Um, if COVID, as it had been, perhaps even with the new variants, um, had been running unchecked 
uh, and, and would do so for four years, assuming it had taken four years for us to develop vaccines, you, one can only imagine the tragedy that that would have represented. So the development of these RNA-based um, vaccines in particular represents a shining moment of the human spirit. And um, I only wish that people didn't uh, um, confuse so, I mean, I, I, I don't understand how anyone can be against vaccines. I, I, I'm of a generation, Sandeep, where I grew up with my, my consciousness seared by images of hospital wards with iron lungs, with people suffering from polio. I mean, to this day, my friend, I am somewhat uh, claustrophobic from those images that were seared into my head as a little boy. Uh, my God, I think these vaccines have been the greatest gift that humanity has ever given itself. Thank you, Wade. Um, so we'll perhaps go to a couple of um, audience questions. Uh, I know there are some already. Uh, for Googlers who ask questions, I think you get a free copy of the book. Um, so Vidya asks, uh, Dr. Davis, this is so fascinating. Do you think ancient wisdom has solutions for some of the diseases that plague us now? COVID, heart disease, obesity? Well, certainly, um, you, you, you know, all, all of these diseases, well, not COVID, but certainly heart disease and obesity are, 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 are um, diseases of, of, uh, that are so preventable. But I think, you know, if I had to say the, the, the greatest disease we suffer from um, is our relationship to the natural world. You know, when we, when we talk, for example, of the psychedelic renaissance underway, there, there's so much talk of people going down to Iquitos and taking ayahuasca, you know, and it's all about, I'm going to get myself better, I'm going to do this. And certainly these substances have great potential in clinical practice. But if, if I was to say that, that the most important healing that we could ever do in our lives, it's healing our relationship with the natural world. And in that sense, I think these indigenous cultures have enormous amounts to teach us. Thank you. Next question. Arabi asks, have you come across examples of adaptation to or mitigation of environmental change or even ecological collapse that you feel hold promise for the world at large? Well, you know, I think, I mean, I think human beings have been um, adapting to uh, shifting climates and uh, shifting challenges um, for all of our history and, uh, from the very moment some of us walked out of Africa. I mean, I think you, you ra it raises a very important question about anthropogenic climate change. Um, um, and, and ultimately, if it, the solutions will lie in some balance of reducing carbon emissions, but also actively mitigating the impacts of, of climate change. Um, and, and hopefully in doing so, we'll just make a cleaner, uh, technologically more integrated and, and simply a healthier environment for, for our children to live in. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, um, um, you, you know, things are, are, are pretty dire in a, in a lot of parts of the world. Um, um, and I think you, I think you just have to do your best to be part of the solution. That sounds a little glib, I suppose. Um, but I, I, for example, am focusing a lot of my efforts on decoupling coca from cocaine because the greatest threat to the Amazon in terms of deforestation, certainly in the Northwest, is people who use cocaine around the world, and that's what's driving the deforestation of the Amazon. So if we could only create a legal market for nutraceutical coca we might be able to um, um, reduce dramatically that deforestation, not to mention bringing an incredibly benign, incredibly useful um, um, and, and mildest of sacred leaves to the, to the um, attention and, uh, of the world. Thank you, Wade. I have one quick question, maybe in a minute. Um, you mentioned that of the 7,000 languages of the world, half are not taught to children, meaning they might go extinct in a generation. Um, you are speaking here at a technology company, and technology companies have an increasingly large influence in our lives. Uh, if you could mention what role does technology play here in preservation of these cultural practices and languages? Well, I, I, I would stress that in general, um, technology is, is never a threat to culture. I mean, individual 
innovations can have huge impacts. For example, when this the snowmobile arrived in Baffin Island in 1962, it really transformed the life of the Inuit because, of course, suddenly they were captive, captives of the cash economy. They had to generate income to buy gasoline parts and so on and so forth. But the idea that technology is is in and of itself a threat is is, is simply silly. I mean, the, the, the Lakota did not stop being Sioux when they gave up the bow and arrow for the rifle any more than an American farmer stopped being an American when he gave up the horse and buggy for the automobile. Um, and in many parts of the world, you know, the internet has kind of emerged as a kind of a global campfire, which has really been a source of empowerment. You know, instead of feeling isolated in the forests of Sarawak, for example, um, the Penan have been able to reach out to the Kayapo in Brazil, who connect them to perhaps a, a group in West Africa. And, and so there's this amazing sense of, of access um, uh, that is really empowering. And even on the simplest basis, um, cell, cell, cell technology and, and uh, smartphone technology has um, allowed peoples like the Elder Brothers to survive 50 years of conflict in which their mountain homeland has at time been overrun by either the guerrillas of the left, the ELN or the FARC, or or the, the murderous paracos of the paramilitary militias of the right. And the phone technology has literally allowed them to keep track of who's where and doing what, which has been incredibly helpful. So, you know, I think I think in terms of, you know, Google has the capacity to give voice to all of these languages of humanity. I mean, you know, one of the things that, w the reason that people weren't talking about language loss really came down to Noam Chomsky, because Chomsky, in his um, brilliance, uh, as he, you know, looked at the nature of language acquisition, and he said, it can't be behavioral. We're all hardwired to acquire language. It happens in every culture, but the same age. There's got to be some kind of cognitive space in the brain, some universal grammar that makes this possible. Let's see what that is. And so for 50 years, that's all linguistics has been interested in. It's as if like, you know, um, if you're a biologist and you want to study DNA, you don't really care if it comes from a fruit fly or a panda bear, it's just DNA. And what happens to the panda bear can be left to the ecologist and the conservation biologist. But with the biology, it's like all the energy of linguistics went to studying the DNA, if you will, or studying or seeking theoretically the structure of this universal grammar. And almost to, as if the, the, the physical expression of that universal grammar, like the phenotypic expression of the genotypic essence of a creature really didn't matter. And Chomsky was almost sending the message that it's pointless to go out to try to document the grammar and dictionaries of these obscure dying languages, because what's the point? Well, the point was everything. And um, the tragedy was that if you gave me all the money in the world today to document the endangered languages in terms of dictionaries, grammars, revitalization programs, I couldn't do it because there are not enough trained linguists who know how to do that kind of field work. And um, that said, around the year 2000, even as I was sort of screaming about this issue, um, uh, a dam broke in linguistics and a whole new generation of scholars began to publish books, uh, hold workshops, put together NGOs, do plans for revitalization. And we're kind of in a different space there, but that's a space that Google could be extraordinarily helpful with simply by, by uh, acknowledging uh, that, that, that each of these languages matters and that the, 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 the importance of a language does not depend on the number of people who speak that language any more than the richness of a piece of poetry depends on the uh, size of the audience um, that listens to the poem being read. You know, Google's in this sort of amazing ability. And that, that's kind of the world we're in, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about this global integrated world and how, how we the goal is not to isolate people and freeze them from all of that. It's as we create this globally integrated world, how can we keep it as rich as it could be? How do we find ways that, that um, uh, uh, allow for people to engage in the best of science and medicine and, and technology, but critically without that engagement demanding the death of who they are. This is the problem with education. Education 
in so many places is not about the transmission of knowledge or skills it's about socialization and enculturation so that if you for example are a nomad in east africa and once one um, adaptive strategy uh, for your family to mitigate the impacts of periodic drought is to have a foot in the cash economy which is fine so the the, 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 the elders say send a, a son or a daughter to parochial school, but the problem is this, where they learn a modicum of literacy, maybe some numeracy, but, but in a context it teaches them to have contempt for who their fathers are or mothers, contempt for their traditions. So they go into these schools as nomads, products of this extraordinarily rich tradition of thousands of years, and they graduate as clerks. And they can't go back because going back is to go back to something they've been taught to be ashamed of. So what does it mean to go forward? Well, you drift to the slums of Nairobi and you try to scratch a living from the edges of a cash economy in which 50% of high school graduates have no job opportunities. Now, the interesting thing is by all the indices of the sort of UN development models, everything's gone up. Everything's gotten better. Urbanization, literacy. Um, mathematical skills, uh, per capita income, but has quality of life gone up? Absolutely not. The people have been shattered. The son has been torn from the father, the daughter from the mother, the culture from itself. Thank you, Wade. Um, we are past the hour now, and unfortunately we have to uh, bring the conversation to an end. Uh, this truly has been an enlightening conversation and your presentation was really very informative. Uh, I believe your book, here again, should be uh, mandatory reading for anybody who's interested in the topics we covered today. Uh, on a personal note, Wade, I've been a big fan of your work and it has significantly impacted my worldview. I'm very thankful to the friend who gave me a copy of your book. And I consider your body of work and your lengthy career, I think you've lived five careers in one lifetime, uh, to be one of the greatest gifts to humanity. And so I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time and speaking to us and sharing your wisdom here at Google today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sandy. Very kind of you to say those things. God bless you. Thank you.